So hello everyone uh, to the Hakif Vienna International Science uh, School. Um, it's my uh, very great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Kostiantin Prat. Uh, so Kostiantin is a graduate of uh, the Hakif uh, Lyceum number 27. We've met a few graduates of that school uh, already. So uh, Kostiantin also uh, studied for his bachelor, master uh, and PhD degrees uh, in, in Hakif. He's held uh, several um, uh, postdoctoral positions uh, all over the place, very prominent uh, institutions. He's currently a postdoc in the group of Vadim Kaloshin at the Institute of Science and Technology, Austria. Uh, so you've already met uh, Vadim. And uh, uh, he is uh, an expert also on dynamic cost systems. Uh, he's had a, a really beautiful article published recently uh, that a, a video has been uh, made of uh, as an illustration. It's a proof of a very classical uh, uh, result uh, that uh, he's, he's done with uh, 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 with Richard Schwartz, who is also uh, a famous mathematician in hyperbolic geometry. Um, and today, uh, Kostiantin is going to teach us about fractals, complex dynamics, and finding roots of polynomials. Privit, Kostiantin, we are very uh, happy to have you. Uh, hi, Mike, Michael. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great honor, and I'm quite happy to be here. Thanks for such a nice <laughs> introduction. Uh, Privit, everyone. Um, so let me start by saying uh, this lecture is supposed to be informal, regardless of the fancy slides that are on the screen. So uh, I encouraged everyone uh, to, to interrupt to ask questions. And moreover, I will be asking questions and some of them will be stupid, but please play along and uh, please answer uh, these questions. So today I will talk about fractals and complex dynamics and finding roots of polynomials, which is like a huge topic. And uh, I'll try to connect it, this all together. And as I promised in the uh, abstract, which some people find quite scary, uh, nonetheless, I promise that you don't have to know complex numbers, which is kind of a challenge, but uh, let me try to uh, live up to this challenge. So. Uh, I will be switching back and forth between my slides and various programs, and I hope it will be kind of illustrative uh, for the purpose. So let me first start with a simple question. Here's, a, here's an equation. So uh, what are the roots of this equation? So please answer either in the chat or just unmute yourself and... Uh... Okay. Shihan said it's six and uh, minus one. Uh, so, uh, Shihan, how, how did you get it? Oh yeah, sorry, I think I factored wrong. Um, it's six and one, actually. So it's uh, six and one. Uh, okay, what is the strategy? Three and two, two and three, okay. Can somebody explain the answer of the answers? Um, okay, so, well, the correct uh, answer. Constantine, uh, uh, explain to us why, why are two and three the solutions? So the, uh, indeed the solutions are, uh, are two and three. And uh, as you can see in the chat, well, first of all, you can just sub, uh, substitute and, and find find out. Uh, of course, the question is why um, why this these are the only roots. And uh, one proof is that you can factor. And indeed, somebody uh, Erza uh, showed us how to factor this polynomial. And clearly, if there's product of two two numbers and it's zero, then one uh, each one of the numbers must be zero. Uh, and uh, there is another keyword that I was actually looking for. There is another way to find out what are the roots. So for instance, to use Vieta's formulas, and this is what everybody uh, use. So um, indeed, the the answers are two and three. And for example, you can do it with Vieta's. 
Okay, let's uh, let's move on. So, what are the roots of this polynomial? Well, let's let's wait for for at least one answer. There should be an answer, and I'm sure everybody here knows how to do the answer, how to do that, regardless of your uh, academic age. Okay. So Derek and Constantine gave us the, the answers and uh, let us check. Um, indeed, the answer is five plus minus square root of five over two uh, using quadratic formula. Thank you, Derek. Indeed, the other way to, to solve a quadratic equation is to use the quadratic formula. Like everybody, uh, at least in Ukraine, studied at school around uh, eighth grade, the, the roots, the formula for the roots of quadratic polynomial, and you just know how to do that using uh, using the coefficients of the polynomial. Perfect. Um, let's move on. So what are the roots of this polynomial? Oh, we have quite an active audience. Come on, guys. So what are the roots? Someone put the answer in the chat. Two plus minus i, four and one. Minus one and five. Okay, there's quite a variety of, of answers. So minus one and five. No answers. Perfect. Okay, so there are, there are two correct answers. And that unfortunately depends on your age. So if you are, uh, for example, studying in eighth grade, so usually what you, what you study how to solve the quadratic equation, you, you compute the discriminant uh, uh, based on the coefficients. And uh, if the discriminant is positive, then you take a square root of the discriminant and uh, you, get the, you get the answer. And if, the, if this guy is negative, then Typically in eighth grade, the answer is no. And um, Polly gave us the, exactly the correct answer, no answer in R. So there are no real numbers that uh, satisfy this equation. But of course, for those who know the complex numbers and for those who are, um, who are brave enough to take a square root of minus one, uh, you basically get the the answer with complex numbers. And of course, this is the right approach. So in principle, the, the, uh, the quadratic polynomial uh, sometimes doesn't have real roots, but it has sometimes these complex roots if you are uh, allowed to take a square root of minus one. And that brings us from the real numbers, which everybody knows here, to complex numbers, which some of us know here. And let me just briefly uh, say, of course, it's kind of impossible to introduce them properly, but for those who uh, think that, that there are no answers, uh, let me convince you that if you uh, assume that the square root of minus one is sort of a number that uh, uh, that can be manipulated with, then you automatically get the extension of real numbers to something which is called complex numbers, and the the set of complex numbers usually denoted by this uh, fancy C, um, and each of the complex numbers can be presented as the real part and the coefficient in front of E, which is just the imaginary part. And you can do um, different operations with the numbers as you do it with actual numbers. And how do you do that? Yeah, let's um, practice a little bit. So here's a uh, kind of the the set of questions. Uh, of course, if uh, we were sitting physically in one room, I would have picked some some brave uh, lady or or guy uh, and uh, uh, put uh, her or him to the board and do that. But unfortunately, that's not possible. So let us uh, look at uh, at the set of questions. So first of all, for those who know it, you can just uh, look at colors and. Uh, uh, well, just just uh, maybe do two exercises for those who see it for the first time. So this this unusual numbers that we just accidentally introduced by allowing to take in the square root of minus one and denoted it by 
i, uh, we created uh, kind of this sets. And how do I uh, add these numbers, for example? Well, kind of easy, uh, or at least intuitively easy. I, I need to add the, the real values, and I need to add the imaginary values here. So if I add uh, two and one, I'll get three. If I add one plus minus three, that will be minus two. And of course, it kind of goes in front of i. So there's nothing, nothing kind of surprising, even if you see it for the first time. So if you think of i as an x, then you just have to manipulate with x's, right? Same for subtraction. Um, so two minus one will be just one. Uh, and here we have one i minus three i, it will be minus two i's. Okay. And so that's kind of clear if you think of i as just an x, right? However, of course, if you start to multiply, then you uh, you'll immediately get something like i squared. But we know what is i squared. i squared is minus one. So to do that, I just need to multiply one by two, it will be just two, then one by i will be plus one i, then minus three times two, that will be minus six i, and then I have to look at minus three i plus times i, which will be minus three i squared. Okay, uh, but we know that i was a square root of minus one, so it's natural to uh, kind of to proclaim that i squared is minus one. So that guy is minus one, and I just need to uh, to collect the terms. So two minus minus one, that will be three, uh, then there will be i and minus six i, it will, will be minus five. Okay, Anna, you have a question. Uh... I think there is uh, in uh, it's not uh, one minus two i, it's uh, one plus four i. One. Um, yeah. Perfect. I mean, I feel that I'm at the real lecture. Yeah, that's, that's the right uh, correction. Thank you, Anna. Uh, so I should. Um, I should uh, do what? That should be uh, plus four, right? Now we're happy. Okay. Um, okay, uh, let us look at this, this calculation and the remaining cal uh, calculation a bit differently. Uh, so let me uh, do a new share of the screen. And for that, I need to go to so now I guess you see the whole of my screen right so let me open my one of my favorite programs which is called GeoGebra and some of you who attended my lectures earlier this week know that I am kind of a big big fan of GeoGebra and of course if you don't know um, well the answers you can compute them as I just did if you want to avoid the mistakes which I usually do, uh, then you should kind of double check it with the computer. So what the GeoGebra allows you to do, it allows you to plot complex numbers. And before the lecture, I plotted these two numbers. So how do we plot complex numbers? Again, for people who know it, it's kind of clear. For people who don't know it, so what is the natural way to do that? Um, so we have two plus i, and uh, if we assume, if you assume that there are kind of two types of coefficients, like the, the one without i, and that will be more or less the x coordinate of a number, and the one in front of the i, and that will be a y coordinate of the number. So I can just plot any complex number as the point on the plane where I put the x coordinate to the real, uh, real value and uh, uh, the one in front of i as a, uh, as a y value. And this, this way you can see clearly that this is uh, two plus i and uh, one minus three i. And uh, luckily for us, GeoGebra uh, allows to do all the manipulation with complex numbers. For example, I can ask her to 
for it to add the numbers. And you, you can see the result of the sum of Z1 and Z2. And as you can clearly see, this is the number three uh, minus two I. And uh, if you like addition of vectors, this is more or less addition of vectors. Then of course I can uh, do the subtraction, say Z1 minus Z2, and I'll get another number, which is uh, one plus four I. Okay. Um, and uh, well, I can do the multiplication. So more or less everything that is uh, that we did, we can double check and we get, uh, so let's see, is that time? So it's five minus five, I, which tell us that I, I did a mistake in the computation. Okay, so the, the product of Z1 and Z2 uh, should be five minus five I. Um, for, for each of the complex numbers, you can associate the, the absolute value of this number, which is just the length of this segment that joins the origin, this, the beginning of the coordinate system to the number. And uh, in the case of that one, so what is the absolute value? Well, you have just to com com compute this, the length of this uh, blue segment, which is just uh, two squared plus one squared, and you, you add them and you uh, take the square root. So that will be square root of five. Um, and that gives us the answer to the question, uh, the question here for the absolute value and the, um, another thing that we can do is to um, compute the, uh, the argument. So this is what you can see here on the left. So the argument is just the, the value of this angle the angle that the corresponding uh, well, segment makes with the x axis. And what would be the sign of this argument? Well, this angle, so the sign should be, uh, well, what is that? Uh, this is one, and I have to divide it by this hypotenuse, so it's one over square root of five. Okay, so this is more or less kind of the basic uh, the basic properties that you can do with uh, with complex numbers, uh, and if you want to double check yourself, just to do it do it in in GeoGebra, which is a fantastic program. What I'm more interested in now is to solve these two exercises. I want to compute the product of two uh, two complex numbers, or I take I want to take the cube. Uh, more or less, I have to do a routine procedure. I have to multiply a complex number times itself, times itself. Uh, and uh, of course, I will do a mistake. So let us see what the GeoGebra uh, tell us. So if I take Z1 and uh, put it to the power two, I'll get this number. Uh, well, Z, uh, this one. Then, uh, if I take the Z1 and put it to the cube, I'll get another number, which is, I think should be somewhere over there. So this is the, the cube of this number. So, and what I'm interested in, in fact, like what would happen to the whole sequence? So what, what I want to understand, what's going on if I, if I keep, uh, multiplying Z1 to itself. And uh, um, another question that I, I want to ask, I mean, I, I multiply it as a natural numbers, but for those who are in the grade 10 and above, you know that uh, you can take a power, not only integer power, like a square or a cube, but you can find a, I don't know, like square root of a number, or you can find a, a, a number to the power then uh, comma, se uh, comma seven and so forth. So what I can do, I want to understand the, um, the behavior of the whole sequence. If I take Z to the power N, like where all these points lie on the, comp on, on the plane. 
And uh, the answer is actually, uh, well, kind of indicated by this strange coordinate system that you can see on the screen. And uh, so let me open it up. Um, so how do, I, how do I actually check? Um, I have something which is called the, the uh, slider. Um, screen. Okay, we can make it. So let us make uh, like a small experiment. Let us take uh, n and let us take it from uh, minus five to 10 uh, with, I'm sorry, it's in Ukrainian, but uh, uh, you, you can trust me, this is just a range. Uh, and what I want to plot, I want to plot um, Z1 as a complex number to the power n. So that one to the power one is just that one. So you can see that this Z15 is a new number that the GeoGebra gave us. So I can, uh, I can uh, recolor it so that it is, um, so that this is red. And now I'll be changing my, my uh, slider. And what, when I change in the slider, I can see the trace of all the possible Z1 to all these different powers that are changing here with the slider. And uh, well, as I march upstairs, you can see I, I pass to Z13, Z14, and so forth, the one that we actually already computed. And we go up. So the, the curve that you can see is actually very quickly diverges to, uh, to infinity. But funny enough, I can also take the slider to the negative ends. And with that, I will, I will converge to the origin. And uh, the, the curve that you can see, we will see today many times. And uh, this curve is actually called the logarithmic spiral. And uh, this logarithmic spiral uh, in polar coordinates, which is just the the distance to the origin and the angle that the point makes with the x-axis is given by this equation. And you can check that all the, the numbers z1 to the power n satisfy this equation to certain values of a, k and a. For that, you just need to uh, kind of unwrap what does it mean to, to take the uh, complex number to some power. Okay, so uh, logarithmic spirals are not very common in, in school mathematics, but they do appear all the time. And what you should remember from this part of the lecture is that if you take a complex number and if you multiply this complex number to itself many, many times, or you do it a bit more advanced, not multiply with an integer power, but take uh, any power, then the all the set of points, the locus of these points will lie on something which is called a logarithmic spiral. And that is an actual spiral as you can, as you, as you saw in the algebra. Okay, as there are questions. Okay, if there are no questions so far, so let us move on and um, you can trust me that if I, not only multiply uh, kind of this blue number two plus i uh, to itself many, many times, but I, for example, start with some other number, this one minus three i, and then multiply all the time by two plus y i, uh, I'll still get a spiral. It will be a different spiral, but I'll still get a spiral. So this is kind of observation that one should keep. And uh, if you want to do an exercise, you can, compute the equation for the spiral. It's actually not hard if you, if you know how to uh, unwrap what does it mean to take this complex number to the power n. Okay, so uh, let us continue with stupid questions. So what is the limit of the sequence? So what is the limit of the sequence as n goes to infinity? For those who know what are the limits. infinity. Um, 
Well, yeah, it depends on your point of view. So it's either infinity or it doesn't exist, but indeed the, the absolute value. So the points become farther and farther and farther from the origin. Um, and if I send n to, to zero, so what would be the limit if I take it? Yeah, that's a good point. It doesn't converge to a particular infinity. Um, yeah, that depends on what, what you mean by infinity. That's true. But what, what is kind of clear for now that the absolute value becomes larger and larger. So this is good for us. Um, so if n goes to, uh, to zero, what is the limit? What is the limit? If n goes to zero, Yeah, so the limit is uh, uh, okay. So the limit is uh, uh, three minus three uh, uh, i. Uh, I don't think it's true. So when okay, let's let's uh, uh, let's do the experiment. So let's do the experiment, and uh, what should we modify? So we should take our z one. That was the our uh, test number, and this another number was z two. Um, so I just need to redefine the number. So let me change the color so that it, it is different from the previous one. Okay, now we now we have the sequence. This that that fifteen is the one, and as you can see, if n is equal to, uh, yeah. Uh, so if n is equal to to zero, indeed, we get uh, z two. Uh, and uh, if I send z to to the negative numbers, I will get indeed. Uh, uh, I'll get zero. Sorry, I probably I, I miss miss asked the question. So if n goes to zero, the answer is right. This is just a two. If n goes to minus infinity, then it converges to zero. But as you can clearly see again from this experiment, the, the locus of this point is the spiral. Okay. Okay. Then uh, let's move on. Yeah. The, uh, the control question is, suppose I have this complex number W, which lies on this unit square. So what is the absolute value of W to the power, well, 2022? And uh, for those who, yeah, so there are a lot of people, well, Xi'an, Constantine, Derek, uh, Poli, well, all the active people, the answer is indeed one. So the answer is one. Um, and is there a limit of this sequence? Is there a limit of this sequence? Well, the limit question, it actually depends. Uh, it depends on what is, uh, uh, yeah, what is the actual position of W? As it is shown, probably the limit is, is no. And um, you can actually, uh, well, if you, if you attended Vadim's lecture, uh, there, was an, there was a similar example. In certain scenarios, the, the, all the possible points that you can get when N kind of goes to infinity, more or less will span the whole circle. Sometimes it will be just a finite number of points. Sometimes it will be the whole circle. And if W is one, then it is one. 
So the, the moral of this kind of control question is that if the absolute value of the number is one, then we cannot tell anything about kind of the long-term behavior uh, as we did in the previous example. In the previous uh, item number one, we knew that if n was um, going to plus infinity, it sort of diverges to infinity, uh, meaning that the absolute value goes to infinity. And if n goes to minus infinity, then it kind of goes to zero. And here, uh, the answer is unclear. Uh, and this is because the, the absolute value of the complex number is one. Okay, so that was um, a very brief introduction to complex numbers. So what are the morals? So the, kind of what you should remember if you multiply a complex number to itself many times, or you start with some other complex number and multiply it by some second complex number many times, then you get a spiral. Uh, unless the absolute value of the uh, the complex number is one, which is not not a spiral. So let's move on, and uh, let's move on to the funny part. So what is the uh, what are the roots of this polynomial? Well, judging from the answers, you you know how to approach it. Like, what would be the approach? Maybe someone someone is quick and can. Uh... Okay, yeah, indeed, there's a, there's a uh, a quick answer. So if you really look at the Yates formula or or some tricks how to find an integer um, integer roots, then you quickly understand that the roots of this polynomial is minus one, two, and three. Um, and what about this polynomial? So what about this polynomial? Well, the it depends on what you what you are trying to do. So if you try to do with the yet, you can clearly understand that there's no integer roots. And uh, okay, let me save up a little bit of time. So the the correct answer, which well. Some of you might have guessed. I don't know. Is 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 the following? So these are the roots of this this uh, innocently looking polynomial. And uh, yes, exactly. Uh, people were just silent and shy. Everybody knew that these are the roots, uh, and it was slow to type in in the chat. Uh, as some of you know. Uh, there is a general formula that allows you to find roots of cubic polynomials. Uh, again, based on the coefficients in the same way as we do for quadratic polynomials. And of course, nobody uh, remembers it by heart, or at least I don't remember it by heart. And uh, honestly, uh, this answer was computed to me by, for me by Mathematica. Um, and there is a, a same story for the quartic polynomials, but of course, uh, and this is a general fact, if we go to polynomials of degree uh, higher than five, higher or equal than five, there is no general formula to find roots of polynomials. And therefore, if we are, uh, if we are facing the problem of finding roots, we must do it numerically. There is more or less no other way, except in some very specific cases where the polynomial uh, well, if, if the polynomial is specific, then yes. But if I give you an arbitrary polynomial, uh, you, you will not be able to find roots. Yeah, yeah, yeah you type too slow. Um, and uh, kind of in here, the story bifurcates. So there's a whole industry of how to find roots of polynomials numerically. And the um, perhaps one of the most famous one is coming from this guy. And uh, uh, who knows who is this guy? Somebody knows? Newton, perfect. Like everybody, or at least this is the what Wikipedia says Newton looked like. Uh, so there is a classical method due to Newton of finding rules of polynomials. So let us look at this. So before going there, so what is showing here on the picture? What is your guess? Mm 
Okay, somebody uh, brave enough in the chat, at least one answer. A line of very zoom polynomial. That's a correct answer. And the truth is in fact, this is this are both, right? So I did a, I did a trick uh, which shows that if I zoom very closely to a graph of the polynomial, and we are talking about the same nasty polynomial, uh, then there will be more or less no distinction between the, the graph and the straight line. And this is the concept of a tangent line. So this, this straight line very nicely approximate our curved line very, very close to a point. And of course, for people who studied a little bit of analysis, uh, you know that, that there's a notion of a, of a derivative. And uh, uh, this derivative is in fact exactly uh, shows the direction of this tangent line. And I have to assume that, well, we know that uh, the derivatives do exist. So uh, here's a polynomial. And uh, again, as you can see, this is a cubic polynomial, which intersects the real line at, at this uh, number x1. And uh, it doesn't intersect the real line anywhere else. And as you can see here from, from these numbers, there's only one real root, and there are two complex roots, right? Because there's a plus i here. So what is the Newton method does? It says, okay, if the, if the tangent line approximates the curve very nicely, let's uh, substitute the line for, for, uh, for a moment. And the, uh, the iteration that we want to do um, is, is the following. So let me... Um, do this oh. it should have been faster okay well uh let me share let me uh, save up again some time so what i want to do i want to start with the uh with some number here and I want to I want to approximate my my curve the green curve by the straight line and I want to take this number as the next approximate so I, um, more or less uh, this is the the computation that shows that I want to go from from this number uh, say let's call it uh, say u zero to this number u1, right? And uh, so what I want to compute, I want to compute what is the dependence of u1, the x-coordinate of this, of this point, uh, based on the x-coordinate of this u0. And uh, well, you can more or less uh, check it explicitly, but if you uh, trust me, then uh, you can just, do the computation and the computation will show you that I have to, so this is my polynomial, let me call it P, then the computation will show you that the next point here is computed by this expression. So this is a polynomial, this is the graph of my line, and uh, this is the derivative of a polynomial. I evaluate it at uh, the value x, uh, u naught, and uh, the next one is u one. And uh, well, if I'm uh, more or less, if I'm lucky enough, then that u one will be my root. If my green line was straight, right? If my green line was straight, then u one will be a root. But the trouble is, it's not a it's not a straight line, and the Newton method suggests that you have to iterate this procedure. So you have to take a U1 and compute the, the corresponding tangent line and again, compute the, the next step by the same formula. Uh, and that would be your kind of next approximate. So let me show you what, what it actually uh, means. On the next slide, I think I have a formula. So that is, this is the formula that we uh, computed. And the 
uh, the whole method uh, basically does what I just said. So you start with the uh, with some number, you compute the tangent, you compute the intersection of this tangent with the x value. So you start with x1, you compute the tangent, you go to x2, then from x2, you go to another one, x3, and then from x3, you go to using this tangent to x4, and so forth. So this is a looped uh, uh, animation. And the theorem that I put here on the slide tells us if, if uh, alpha is some root, for example, uh, as shown here on the slide, this is alpha. And then if I start with my x1, with my starting uh, well, prediction, uh, sufficiently close to the root, then uh, the sequence of this iterates, and this is more or less x1, then I compute x2 using this formula for the Newton, uh, Newton map, just substituting instead of x, x1, that will be x2. Then I can do the next step. I substitute x2 uh, to the Newton map and uh, compute x3. Then the sequence actually converges to the root. And you can see it uh, on this animation, right? This, this uh, point x4 becoming closer, x5 is more or less undistinguishable from the root. So the, the message here says that there's a, there's a procedure based on the substitute in the curved line, which is your polynomial with the tangent line and do it iteratively. And if you start close enough to a root, then this procedure will find you this root. So this is a theorem, and it's actually not really hard to prove it uh, if you know a little bit of analysis. The question that you must ask uh, in this the theorem, so what does it mean sufficiently close? What if I start not sufficiently close? And this is in fact a nightmare for, for people who are doing numerical analysis, because this, this is a super powerful method, Newton method of finding roots if you start really close to a root, but it is really uh, unpredictable uh, if you start far away. And the question that we want to understand, so we have some map, you can see it here on the slide, and we do iteration of this map. So when you do an iteration of a map, you enter a realm of dynamical systems. Right, so you have a particular map and you do a discrete iteration starting from a point, you go with your map to the next point and the next point and so forth. And you want to understand what is the long-term behavior of these orbits. For example, for the Newton method, it's kind of important to understand if the points converge to the root. Can this algorithm get hung up? Yes. Uh, if by hang up meaning that it doesn't work, then yes. Um, so, and we can see it uh, momentarily. So one step with, that we should do, uh, we should substitute X with Z. Um, although, although it's just not, uh, just uh, letters, but, but uh, kind of morally, X is usually a real number. And of course we want to find roots uh, or polynomial for complex numbers. And uh, you can write the same formula and you can check that the same theorem actually holds if I iterate a Newton map where P is a polynomial uh, in complex variables. So what I want to do now, I want to actually see a global picture. What is actually going on globally? Can I understand how the orbits of points behave under the iteration of the Newton map? So what I um, want to do, uh, well, I want just to experiment. So uh, let us consider the dynamical plane of this polynomial. So let me guide you through. So this is the polynomial that we're talking about. Um, if I compute the Newton map, remember the Newton map is this formula. I need to I take X minus, uh, uh, well, minus the polynomial over its derivative. And if I, uh, well, kind of combine it all together nicely, I'll get this formula for, for the map. So what, what is this picture tells us? 
So I pick an arbitrary point. I know that this polynomial has three roots. Remember x1 was the root on the real line. So x1 was this root where the cubic uh, curve intersected the x axis. But there were two uh, complex numbers, which of course everybody remembers because they were slow to type it in in the chat. And these are these two points clearly, uh, blue and green. And what can I do? I can do an experiment. I can just take a point, for example, oh, let me change the color. Um, where is a good color? Say white. So I, I can take a point, uh, say x naught, then I can apply my map to this point and see where the, the image of this point lies. My light here. And then I kind of keep iterating. And if I can check and numerically this orbit of points converges to the uh, root x1, which is a red root, I color this x naught in red. Which means that in this picture, all the kind of red points, they, under the iteration of the map, they converge to the root x1. Kind of the theorem that we discuss actually holds in this neighborhood. Like all the points nearby of the root, they do converge to a root. But apparently there are other points which are kind of far away. If I click on them and iterate, I will actually land on the root. I can do the same for other roots, uh, blue and, and green, and color points accordingly. And uh, well, more or less, I will color every point on the plane, well, modulo some, some numerical precision, but every point on the plane. So, and trouble is that there are red points, there are black points. And what are the black points? The black points are exactly the points that do not converge to roots. And uh, you can see here that this th there's a big array of points that do not converge to roots. And that causes the trouble for, uh, for numerical analysis. Because imagine that you do an experiment and then you start with your X naught here. And this is exactly where the algorithm fails because the point here will not converge to any root. In fact, this point will do uh, to jump, will jump here and then will jump, oops, then will jump uh, here and then we'll again jump there and so forth. So it will do kind of back and forth between these two small regions if you check it. So that is a problem of a Newton method. And uh, this phenomenon was known in the 80s already. So the Newton method is doesn't converge all the time. And there are open regions of points, very big uh, regions of points where points where orbits do not converge. And uh, and now, of course, depending on your preferences, you can say, well, it's either a blessing or a hell. If you are a numerical analysis, an analyst and you want to find roots, then you can say, well, this is, this is all bad because I don't know where to start in principle. Uh, but if you do dynamical systems, as I do, uh, for me, this is a super curious dynamical system. And the question you may ask, like, is it the only way the Newton method can fail? So is kind of the presence of these big regions is the only way the Newton method can fail. And um, well, let me give you the complication of the question. So as I said, the um, everything on this picture, uh, if it's colored in uh, red, uh, green, or blue, it converges to the corresponding root. Everything that is not colored converges to nothing. And the question is, what does this point do? under the iteration of the method of this map. Um, and the question is, of course, like how many of the black points are there? Uh, and let me tell you that there is not only this big bulbs of, of black points, but there's also the interface between these two regions, which is hard to see. But um, let me simplify it a little bit for you and, uh, and take a more simple example. So let's take a much, much simpler polynomial, z squared, z cubed minus one. So if you want to find the roots of this polynomial, then uh, these roots are actually uh, shown here on the, on the slide. So there is, a, um, there is zero one. So the, the root is uh, kind of one is a root, but there, there's complex roots uh, with this real part and with this imaginary part and their complex conjugate. And again, on the left, 
I color everything that converges to the corresponding root. Uh, but there is an interface. And if I kind of switch off the color, I will get with this with this beautiful set. So this white set where, where just uh, illuminated all the colors and more or less colored everything black, which converges to the roots and everything white, which does not. I received this, this I obtained this, this beautiful picture. So this is an instance of a fractal. And this is a, an instance of what we call Julia set. So these fractals, or they, they're sometimes called Newton fractals, uh, they exhibit a chaotic behavior of orbits under the iteration of a Newton map. And uh, kind of with this presence of this orbit, of these objects, we kind of enter the, the realm, the realm of what is called a complex dynamics. So my, my goal is now to understand what's going on for these points. Can I say something meaningful? Can I say uh, like what can go wrong? How big is this set? Like, is, it, is this set causes problem for people from numerical analysis or is it just so tiny that uh, under kind of real life scenarios, I will never be able to put a point there because the precision will be so, so um, bad that I cannot just hit this, this small set. So this is all the questions that people in complex dynamics are interested in. Why it is complex? Well, because we're iterating something over the complex plane. And uh, let me slowly go uh, into the answer. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is, a, this is an instance of a fractal. And the word fractal is coming from, uh, I guess, Greek. And the idea is that the structure of this set is very similar on, on many scales, right? You can see that there are a lot of pieces that are kind of resembles themselves. And if you zoom closer, closer, you will get the same structure all over. And uh, because of this beauty, it's actually hard to study this set because it's not a curve, right? It's not something like you can draw with a, with a pencil. Um, and uh, there is a big variety of the sets. And here's an example of what you can actually get uh, in the Newton situation. Uh, I think they're kind of beautiful. And uh, oops. Um, what are the black points? Okay, I think I answered that the black points are those that do not converge to roots. And what is the algorithm for drawing such plane? Um, the algorithm usually is a direct one. You more or less, you, you take an arbitrary point and if it converges to a root, then you uh, color it. And convergence is measured, you, you, you put some error, like I don't know, 10 to the minus 10, and if kind of under the iterate, you're close, closer than 10 to the minus 10 to the root, which you know beforehand, then you put a color for the point. And of course there are artifacts. For example, you can see here this, this red star, which is not part of the set. And the star appears only because kind of the points here, it's hard to distinguish algorithmically. And therefore uh, there are artifacts for the sets. So the main algorithm is just, you do what you have to do, but um, uh, once you come to, to very nasty points, you might need either increase your precision or do more iterates. So it's actually computationally heavy. Okay, so the, the field of complex dynamics actually uh, complex holomorphic dynamics. Uh, holomorphic stands from the uh, holomorphic functions, uh, but uh, for now we can just disregard it. So complex dynamics because we iterate comp maps that are defined over complex numbers. They, it started with the work of Gaston, Gaston Julia and Pierre Fatou uh, in the 20s uh, of 20th century. So it was long ago. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, their work was, they did their work and then it was for forgotten until the, the next era where uh, in the 80s, Adrian Duadi and John Hubbard, they kind of reinvented uh, holomorphic dynamics, complex dynamics. And uh, they, they wrote a couple of very, very influential papers in the field and show that there's a, a lot you can say uh, about iteration of uh, functions such as Newton map and other functions, uh, for example, polynomials, which we'll talk about a little bit later. 
and uh, since the 80s, since the work of Duardi and Hubbard, uh, the, the whole branch of dynamical system, complex dynamics, uh, now kind of flourishing in, in many ways. And uh, there are a lot of people doing active research in this direction. And this is actually one of the uh, phenomenal branches, I would say, of complex dynamics, of, of uh, dynamics or, or mathematics, because there's a, there's a huge list of people, uh, actually, well, full professors in their respective universities that are working in complex dynamics from Ukraine. And uh, all but one in this list that I dare to put on the slide are from, from Kharkiv. And maybe all but one from that list is from, from one of the, well, the, the 27 school. So one of the uh, strongest mathematicians, Misha Lubitsch, who is a professor in Stony Brook University. And you can see here the list, uh, uh, Alex Yeryominka, Sasha Bloch, uh, Michael Yampolsky, Sergei Mirenkov, Tom Tutko, Natasha Gonchuruk, and Volodya Nikarsevich uh, from, from Kiev. And uh, of course, this is just the list of people who are doing complex dynamics, but there's a lot, of, a lot more people who are doing dynamical systems coming from, from Kharkiv. Uh, well, Vadim um, and, uh, and many others. And there are even more people who are kind of working in the field adjacent to uh, dynamical systems, also coming from the city of well, Svetlana is one of those. Um, so it's actually a remarkable situation when you come to a conference, uh, like in a very relatively small subfield of huge mathematics, and you find, well, eight people from the same city. Um, so it's kind of interesting phenomenon. Um, okay, so let me continue. So remember that our goal is to understand what's going on in this Newton dynamical plane. And the uh, kind of the understanding is coming actually from the work of uh, Duardi and Hubbard, uh, who suggested that we need to iterate, um, that we need to iterate um, ah, uh, well, sorry, before going, going into that, let me give you a convincing argument why you need to uh, iterate over complex numbers, but not over real numbers, even if you want to find real roots. So here on the slide, you can see a polynomial, a polynomial uh, of degree four. You can see the coefficients, well, I put the coefficients, just huge numbers, uh, well, small, very small numbers. The trouble with this polynomial, and this is the graph, as you can clearly see from the picture, it, it intersects the axis, the x-axis at four points, right? It's sort of uh, uh, clearly visible in, in, in quotation marks. Well, because the roots are very close to each other, right? And you have to zoom, zoom, zoom in. And to run an, an effective algorithm, it's actually really hard because the, the roots are very close to each other. And remember the theorem that kind of allows you to find roots, just you have to be very close to a root, but if the roots are close to each other, then it's not clear where to start. But if I, if I plot the same picture over the complex numbers, this is what I will see. So I will see a region um, more or less divided into six uh, well, sectors with this fractal set in between, which is small and we can with disregard. And somewhere in this bright uh, spot, you, you have four roots. They are located on the real line, which is here. But you see, you, you, you have much more space to start. You can start your iteration, not on the, on the real line where kind of it's already crowded. You can start your iteration, for example, here. And this, if you start with the point somewhere here, then its orbit will converge to to well to this root to kind of to the second from the left. If you start your iteration here, your orbit will converge to the one uh, leftmost. If you start your iteration here, it will converge to the second from the right, and so forth. So on the over the complex number over the complex plane, you have much more space, and have, therefore it's kind of profitable to iterate. Well, of course, there are these problems with the with the Julia sets, um, and we need to understand what's going on there. So, um, 
to do that, and as I said, kind of it was suggested by Duadine Hubbard, we need to understand the, the most simplest map. The Newton map is a nice map, but it's kind of not a simple one. Uh, it is a rational map. And uh, as you know, even in the school education, you usually start kind of the education from linear maps, then you go to quadratic polynomials, then you study kind of polynomials of higher degree, and only then you go to rational maps. So the logic tells us that we should start with polynomials. And let me tell you a little bit of a story of the iteration of polynomials. Before that, if there are questions, if there are questions for what I just said. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's move on. So what I want to do now, I want to understand the iteration of polynomials. And let me be simple. Let me understand the iteration of quadratic polynomials. Um, so I start with a polynomial, which is written as a, a z squared plus b z plus d. So all of these numbers are complex. Uh, a, b, and d are just uh, complex numbers. They're fixed coefficients. And z is the one that I have to change. And I want to understand like what's going on with the orbit of arbitrary point z. So the orbit, as we already kind of discussed, and, and probably it's intuitively clear, I, I start with z, I apply my polynomial, I look where the, the value of this polynomial lies. And remember, if the polynomial is over the complex number, the value of the polynomial is also a complex number. So more or less, I go from a complex number, complex number to a complex number, and I can iterate this procedure. So there are three coefficients, but uh, you should trust me, it's not hard to see that we can, we can kill two coefficients without loss of generality. We can just iterate the polynomial uh, that square plus, uh, uh, plus C. So it should be plus here. Oops. So we can just iterate the polynomial where the, the leading term is one and I have just a three term here. And uh, that is more or less just a change of coordinates. Uh, you have to put a full square somewhere. One of the rations that is super useful for polynomials, if you start your iteration somewhere really, really far away, meaning that if your absolute value for, for your starting number is sufficiently large, then the orbit of this value will, convert, will diverge uh, to infinity. In the same way as we discussed with the with the with the spirals, so the absolute value of the iterates, as it's written here, will go to infinity. Therefore, there is an interesting set. Like, is there points that do not converge diverge to infinity, and uh, that defines what is what is called a fielding Julia set, as a set of points in the complex plane such that the orbit of this point remains bounded. And I think that was a kind of the pivotal point in the whole field when uh, kind of this definition was given. And then, well, as you can clearly imagine, it's super easy to do it on the computer, right? You have a polynomial, you pick a point, and then you just iterate it. And you see if it kind of diverges to infinity, then you, you stop. By, by using some criteria. And if it doesn't, then you color it differently. And uh, the 80s was the, exactly kind of the, the starting uh, time for computer experiments, and that really helped the field. And uh, well, let us see how, how, this, uh, how these creatures do look. So if I just, just consider one example, let's take a very classical example, which is called the basilica. And this is a polynomial z squared minus one. And uh, on the left, you can see a black uh, object, which is exactly the set of points uh, under the iteration of the map, which do not converge to infinity, which means that if I start with this map, with these points, they will stay in this black region. Well, for example, if I start, if I start with the point zero, then if I plug in zero uh, in this polynomial, I'll get zero squared minus one, 
instead will be minus one. Uh, and if I plug minus one again, then uh, uh, minus one squared will be one, minus one will be zero. So zero goes to one and minus one goes to zero. And this is a, what is called a two cycle. And it turns out that kind of points nearby, they converges to this two cycle. We can actually see it on the, on the bigger screen. So let me, um, so um, I have a program which is called Mandel, uh, which was written by Wolf Jung. Um, and uh, this is where you can actually experiment with this, with this uh, type of things. Uh, so what can I do? I can, I can take a, so this is my, my plane. I can take any point, for example, this one, you can see the yellow dot and I can apply the map and you can see what is the trajectory of the map. So just trace this yellow cross. And this is this blinking one, this is the minus one and zero. Like this is the two cycle that we converges to. If I start somewhere here, then I will go again to this two cycle. So the points in this black regions, they do not escape. They do not escape and they just um, alternate. Um, opposite to the point that I mark here in green. So if I pick a point here, it's, it's not that visible, but this is the point. And let me start to iterate. I apply a map and the image of this point is here. I apply a map again and the image is here. I apply a map again, the image is here. Again, the image is here. And you can trust me if I apply it again, it will just disappear from the screen. So all the points in the complement, they uh, kind of march off to infinity. But there is an interesting set in between. So there's a set in between green and kind of the solid uh, black. And this is what you can see on the left. So the boundary of this thing, it's called the Julia set. And this is another fractal. So the dynamics of the points on this set is actually chaotic. It's hard to, it's hard to illustrate, but um, more or less if I pick a point on the boundary, then it will do some kind of uh, really jumping around, but it's hard to pick the right point. So it's hard to kind of illustrate it in the program, but you should trust me that this Julia set is exactly kind of the region where the chaos happens. Okay. So this is just the example of a particular polynomial with a particular property. And of course, the question that you should ask uh, what about uh, other polynomials? Like, is it, uh, uh, yes, points in the Julia set, they stay in the Julia set. Uh, will we have a cycle for every point inside the black area or simply a convergence sequence? So in the black area, it depends on where you start. If you start really at the cycle, if you start at zero, you will be at the cycle. Any other starting point will converge to the cycle, right? It will never kind of land on the cycle, but it will, well, it can land, I'm, I'm sorry, it can land, but uh, most of the points uh, will converge. So the, uh, both of the sets, they are invariant, which means that if I start in the black set, I will stay in the black set in the field Julia set. If I start in the Julia set, I will stay in this Julia set. Okay, um, so the fractal that we saw for the Newton map is a bit kind of, well, it's, it requires a little bit of more knowledge to define. So we define this object just by saying that many points that convert, diverges to infinity, and we just want to understand which points do not. You cannot do it for any map. This is the property of polynomials, and that brings kind of a lot, a lot of structure to the uh, space of polynomials. Uh, yeah, so the points in the Julia set, they stay in the Julia set by chaotic. Um, so it has a root, so it will be a fixed point. Yes, yes, so there, there will be a fixed point. Let me show the fixed point. Um, so the fixed point will be exactly here. 
So if you compute the fixed point, it will be this one. Um, again, well, if I if I iterate, it will start to move. But if you trust me, if I zoom a little bit better, then uh, well, it it will stay here. I just have to pick it properly. Um, one thing that you can see from my um, from my demonstration that I'm zooming in, right? I, I zoom in, and more or less you see no difference. And this is exactly the property of kind of fractal objects. Uh, will there be points converging to that fixed point? Um, no, to these points, there will be no converging points. There will be points that land on this point. Um, so there will be points that kind of in one or say five iterates land exactly at this point, but uh, never converge. Because you see nearby the dynamics is, is kind of repelling. So points nearby repel from, from this fixed point. So you cannot converge to a to repelling point. Okay. Um, so what we want to um, yeah, uh, so you can ask uh, why why the the, the name is uh, uh, Basilica, and the answer is that because it well it it resembles this uh, uh, this uh, uh, Basilica of Saint Peter in in Venice, reflected in the in the river, and there are many creative names for many fractals, and this is kind of one of those. Uh, and of course, you want to study. Okay, this is a particular example that's square minus one. Um, what about others? So what we have to do, we have to go to the um, to this space of parameters, and this is where the famous Mandelbrot set appears. So let me uh, just just uh, um, pronounce it. So the, if we start with the quadratic polynomial, the square plus c. So c is the parameter. So changing parameter, I can uh, I can change the dynamics of a map. And uh, this is a little bit non-intuitive, but to understand the dynamics of this polynomial, you really have to understand the, the set of points where, where the, the derivative of a polynomial is equal to zero. This are the, poly, this are the points that are called critical points. So these are critical points. And the kind of the moral of the philosophy of complex dynamics, you have to understand the critical points. Kind of, this is more or less because the, the critical points are exceptional points and there are only finitely many points for, for polynomials uh, because there are only finitely many solutions for this equation, uh, the derivative is equal to zero. However, um, and all the rest sort of behave in accordance with the polynomial, or at least we have some control. So at this stage, it's kind of, it might be a little bit mis, uh, kind of mysterious why, but uh, you should trust me on that. But uh, if you if you do trust, then you can see that the the only critical point for this polynomial, right? If I take the the derivative of z square, I will get to z, and this is equal to zero if z is equal to zero. So z equal to zero is the critical point, and uh, we define a weird set. So now you have to twist your brain a little bit. And the twisting is that I want to consider the set of parameters such that the orbit of this critical point for this parameter does not escape. So this is a, well, well this is a definition. Right, you can define whatever you want. The question is, it's uh, natural, but the fact is, it's it's extremely natural, and uh, it actually allows you to understand everything if you understand this set. So the set of point, the set of parameters for which the critical point does not escape, and that yields a famous Mandelbrot set. So th that yields the famous Mandelbrot set. Um, so let us uh, let us have a look at this Mandelbrot set. 
Uh, so this is how it looks. So this black, wonderful, beautiful fractal object that you saw in my title slide is uh, the Mandelbrot set. It was introduced by Benoit Mandelbrot, uh, well, exactly with this definition. And uh, it's actually extremely interesting that this beautiful picture is insanely complicated. In one of the central questions in complex dynamics presently, which is unanswered, like what is going on at the boundary of the set. So we know what's going on like in this blue regions. We know mostly what is going on in this uh, big black regions. But as usual, and as you can now understand, like what is the interface? What is going on for those parameters? And that appears to be extremely hard questions. Uh, well, open until now. And uh, there's a very deep research uh, going on in, in different um, research groups. And uh, these questions are actually connected to many other questions in dynamical systems. Um, this is a beautiful picture, right? This is a picture from, well, our century. Let me show you the picture from the previous century. And this is the original picture by, by Mandelbrot. Uh, in the era where the computer was not very powerful and can compute only so much. So that was the kind of the resemblance of this picture. And uh, the funny story that I've heard that there's a, there's a particular part in the Mandelbrot set up here. Uh, and uh, it was kind of indicated with this, uh, with this uh, uh, process. And um, people who were uh, doing the editing for the journal where the Mandelbrot actually sent it to, they thought it's kind of a, well, a type or, or kind of a scratch. So they basically removed it because it was kind of un, unnatural to them. So unwillingly, they more or less kind of killed uh, one of the most interesting parts of the, or structural parts of the Mandelbrot set. But this is because, well, the graphic was, was exactly like that. Um, and um, another bit of history, which I find uh, also amusing, that the uncle of the Mandelbrot whom he is actually attributing many of his mathematical kind of education and inspiration. So Mandelbrot uh, did his education in, in Paris, but his, his uncle was also in Paris and was also a mathematician. He actually did his master's in Kharkiv, in Kharkiv Imperial University, which later became Karazin University. And uh, well, that's kind of an interesting twist of the history. Um, okay, so let us... Uh, uh, I, I think I have to finish maybe soon. I, uh, maybe I need uh, five more minutes to show something. I was hiding another part of this picture clearly because there is a Mandelbrot set on the left. And this is a program where we can actually play. So on the left, I can choose a parameter C and on the right, I can see the, the field in Julia set of a polynomial. And uh, if I choose another parameter, the Julia set actually changes, as you can clearly see here. Uh, if I go to some other parts, then uh, there's uh, some other bits. And uh, you might wonder what's going on if I click somewhere outside. Well, this is what is called a Mandel dust, because it's more or less a bunch of points. And uh, this is a set. This is a very, very tiny set. For those who know, it's a counter set like everything around it is, is just a counter set. It's not even connected, just a bunch of points. However, everything that is inside is connected and it has a particular dynamics and depending on the, on the uh, place in the Mandelbrot set, it has a, its particular dynamics. And uh, what you can see clearly here, so if I go, for example, to this part of the Mandelbrot set, and let me let me choose something. I not here. Okay, I think that's good enough. Mm. So on the left you can see some some z square plus c, where c is well you can see here this complex number. And um, the fixed point of this map, which as was rightly observed, exists. Uh, is this is somewhere here. And if I zoom around this fixed point, um, what you can kind of actually see, kind of the set is very twisted. 
all around, but it also kind of spirals around many of its points. And the reason why it spirals around many of the points is because it spirals around the fixed point and that the spiraling propagates. And the reason why, okay, let me probably, um, so let me make more convincing. Ah, yeah, that's I think more convincing. Oh, this is even more convincing. So this is a, a picture around the, oops, around the fixed point. And uh, I'm just zooming to the fixed point. And I guess it's kind of clear that we can see a spiral. And this is exactly the spiral that we discussed in the very, very beginning. So the dynamics here, in the same way as the tangent line is the same as the curved line, very, very close to the tangent point, in the same way, if I zoom very close to the fixed point, the dynamics here will be just multiplication by the same number. And as we discussed, if you multiply, if you fix the complex number, keep multiplying it to itself, you produce spirals. And this is the reason why all this fractal says they are kind of super uh, spirally in many points, because it's spiral at, at this point and then it kind of propagates everywhere. So this is kind of one of the reasons uh, why, why kind of these fractal sets are that um, complicated. Okay. So maybe let me really quickly wrap up. What is the right, why it's changed? Um, so the, I am picking different parameters. So on the left, I can pick a parameter C. Remember on the right, I study uh, the dynamical plane of that square plus C, right? I, I just study which point escape uh, to infinity and which point is not. But of course, what is C? Well, C is this number. This is this is the number I picked. This is C. And you can see it, well, here explicitly. Well, this is this complex number. And therefore, if I change C, I will change the picture on the right. So this is the, well, the program that's, uh, well, you can actually play with the manual set. Okay, so let me uh, quickly wrap up. Um, why it is connected to the, to the Newton story? It's actually interesting, well, uh, whole story and so on. So let me uh, try to connect. So let me illustrate it just, just by, by pictures. Um, Again, twist your brain a little bit. So I want to understand cubic polynomials. So this is the, the way to write a cubic polynomial. Uh, I just prescribe where the roots of this cubic polynomial are, and they depend on the parameter C. Right? For this polynomial, I can cook up its Newton map, N sub P, by that formula that we discussed at the beginning. And now I want to study the dependence of, of the dynamics of this uh, Newton map, depending on, on C. And I need to do something like the Mandelbrot set. I need to color things and see what's going on. And this is the way how to do that. Remember, critical points are important. I need to take the derivative and solve the equation the derivative is equal to zero. If you do it for this Newton map for this polynomial, you will get four points, these two points, which are roots of the polynomial. And there is another uh, critical point, which is so-called free critical point. And now the picture on the left is constructed in the following way. So on the left, I always pick the parameter C. So for example, a point here. And now I, I color it differently. I color it with this French blue color if for this choice of C, the critical point zero, which is, uh, uh, well, it lives somewhere on this right part, converges to the root, uh, to, to this root. I color it red if it converges to another root, and I color it 
green it, if it converges to the third root. But remember, there might be something that does not converge to any roots. And on the picture on the left, you can see this object. And the, the logic is that, well, this is actually the copy of the Mandelbrot set. And if I quickly go to the program that I was showing you before, I can, uh, I can change the, I can change the function. And again, this is a scientific program. I can choose a Newton map. The color scheme is a bit different. It's a bit psychic, but, uh, but more or less, this is what I'm saying. So I do have a coloring scheme. So if I pick a point, which is blue, you see here, I picked a C here. Then there's a critical point, the zero, and let us see where this point converges to. I iterate it. Let's trace this, this cross. If I iterate it, as you can see, it converges to the, to the blue root. In this region, uh, the point zero, which is here, will converge to the, to the green root. Well, and uh, it is here. In the, in the region here, again, everything changes when I pick a different parameter. It converges to the, um, well, the zero here converges to the red root. But you can see this object. Well, somewhere in the kind of parameter plane of a Newton map, out of sudden, we can see the Mandelbrot set. And if I pick a point in the Mandelbrot set, you see what's going on? We out, out of sudden see these big black blobs that prevent our Newton method from converging. So the presence of this Newton, this Mandelbrot set is kind of one of the reasons why the Newton method converge, and does not converge always. And finally, you can ask the question, is it the only reason? The picture that you can see now on the screen uh, was known in the 70s. So the, uh, the appearance of the Mandelbrot set in the cubic situation was known in the 70s, but for a long time, it's been kind of open um, question, is it kind of the only problem? And uh, coming back to the modern research, this is the theorem that I proved with uh, Dirk Schleicher, which is my uh, great collaborator and mentor, uh, which was just recently published a year ago, uh, which says that um, more or less this is the only problem that can occur. And uh, the, the power of the theorem that I do not restrict to cubic polynomials, I just restrict to, well, I, I take any polynomial and I can say that the orbits of the Newton map either converges uh, to root as they should, or there is kind of a Julia set of a polynomial embedded, and that is kind of the, the problem, or everything else I can actually uniquely describe by some symbolic dynamics. And if you attended Vadim's lecture a couple of days ago, this is exactly the same way to code a dynamical system. There is a certain Markov partition that allows you to distinguish points from each other by its symbolic dynamics. So the theorem, well, super recent one, tells that there is nothing else can go wrong except for these uh, polynomials embedded in the Newton dynamical plane. And uh, well, that kind of connect the story uh, well, through through many years. And uh, well, maybe in conclusion, uh, the uh, the whole field is is uh, now more or less study uh, either kind of general rational maps or there is the super hard questions for, for quadratic polynomials or for polynomials in general. But the result of this kind tells us that it might be that uh, every complication that can be for, for strange and uh, complicated maps that are there are only coming from, from complications for polynomials. So in short, if you study in the ninth grade and you don't know um, well, much of, a, I don't know, analysis and stuff, uh, and you know polynomials, this is what you should study, right? The, the moral is that we need to understand polynomials better. And if we do understand, kind of, we can cook up results like this. So, uh, the, um, 
the complications might be coming from polynomials. And uh, of course, uh, the th thing that you can see, kind of this is a beautiful fractal world of uh, Mandelbrot set, and you probably saw these this wonderful pictures. Some of them are just beautiful, some of them are scientifically meaningful and beautiful. And uh, uh, if you were it in Austria and in Kloster Neuenbrook, I would bring it to my office where you can see this poster. This is a poster you can see all over the world, where is a beautiful map of the Mandelbrot set with the different phenomena that we can observe that links to different type of uh, combinatorics, uh, different type of symbolic dynamics, analytic questions, questions in, from different fields of dynamical systems, from analysis, and so forth. So it's actually a beautiful and uh, big world over there. OK, I think I have to stop. I, I went much over time. I think, thank you for attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kosyantin, for this uh, truly beautiful lecture. Uh, I guess it's bringing to show that some of us are in math for all the beautiful pictures. Uh, questions from the audience? Uh, don't be shy. Any questions for Kostiantin? David. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, the Julia medallions that are described like in the bottom left corner. Yeah. Um, do we understand why like Julia sets appear in the Mandelbrot set? Because it seems like a very different um, space, even that we are in. Like, uh, yes, there there is a there is a work of uh, uh, a researcher called Tanley, which she basically explained why why you can expect copies of um, of uh, Julia sets in the Mandelbrot set. Mm, okay. Yeah. That's um, and also this poster, where can I get it? Because it's very interesting. <laughs> um, well, you can you can look at it uh, just just online. You can you can buy it. Uh, uh, <laughs> so it is. I mean, it's truly beautiful poster uh, made by uh, well this guy over here. Um, can you post the name into the chat, Kostiantin? Sorry. Can you maybe post uh, the name of the guy uh, who made it into the chat so we can all buy it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have no connection to the to the selling department. I guess we need to say that now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe also, maybe also the uh, the reference uh, that David uh, was asking for. Uh, if you can post it into the chat. Uh, so um, sorry, I missed the what was the question? Mathematician who proved. Uh, ah, Tanley. Thank you. Uh, Ashia from Delhi, uh, good to have you. Uh, I had a question on like whether you can study a similar like theory in quarter. I don't know like how to, what are the algebraic theorems for polynomials in quaternions and like generalization of fractals, but I mean, I don't know like is, is that so like a thing or? Um, as you as you probably know, uh, there is a certain limit we can go with the uh, generalization of complex numbers. Um, I don't know a meaningful uh, kind of theory involving quaternions. Uh, what you can, of course, do you can ask like, can you say take two complex numbers, right? Can you can you study dynamics in not on the complex plane, but say uh, on the product of two complex planes, so-called C2. And you can do that. And this is a completely different world. It's much harder, uh, essentially because the, the tools from complex analysis, which are very much used here, they are no, no longer available in uh, higher dimensions. And uh, they, uh, they do make some progress in terms of understanding <clears throat> what's going on. But um, uh, I don't think they can do uh, much uh, kind of to the extent uh, of the Mandelbrot set. Okay, and like, so does the theory specifically focus on polynomials? Or I mean, I, I'm guessing it's, it might be easier for some other family of functions. No, there's no, there's no specific focus on polynomials. So let me pull out this, this program again. Um, 
uh, okay, so let me, so this is the program by uh, Wolf Jung, uh, and it's called Mandel. It's a beautiful program. It's actually well scientific based, and you can see here there's a, a kind of a menu with functions. So you can do a lot with the Mandelbrot set. You can go to the kind of multi-broad set, uh, but then you can go to polynomials of higher degree. You can go to or cubic polynomials, quadratic polynomials. You can go to rational mappings. And in the rational mappings, you do have, well, Newton mappings, this is one of the cases. Uh, for cubic polynomials, there's, uh, I don't know, something for uh, uh, some other slices of uh, quartic polynomials. Uh, there is rational mappings, for example, uh, which is, uh, mm, let's see, I don't know, let, let me put in rational mappings of, of this type. Um, uh, that's not a very good example. I don't, for example, this one. Right, so this is kind of different type of maps that you can appear and study the spaces of maps. Right, so this is not no longer polynomial. This is some sort of a rational map, and you can you can say, okay, why why do we restrict ourselves to polynomials, rational maps? You can go to what is called transcendental dynamics. For example, you can study the dynamics of the sine function. Right, and you will get a completely different picture for the sine function, and this is the, the parameter plane, and you can see here the dynamical plane, which is uh, trust me, much harder than that because the the accuracy of this picture is not very good. Uh, but um, yeah, you can study the dynamics of the sine function, for example, or you can study the dynamics of the exponential map or the variation of those. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you can go to something which is non-analytic, but this is a different different story. Kostiantin, uh, you promised polynomials do the trick. <laughs> What? You promised polynomials are enough. Ah, um, uh, yes, 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 yes. I mean, you see, <laughs> this is uh, this is the um, parameter space for the sine function. Mm -hmm. um, let me zoom to this this part of the parameter space. I mean, you see that the the, the Mandelbrot set. So the, the task, and this is actually an open question. And uh, uh, there... I was going to say promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, there is a good hope that we can understand many, many families of maps just by saying that we know polynomials and all the rest that is not polynomial is kind of understood by other means, for instance, by symbolic dynamics. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is this is a conjecture and a, hope, a, a philosophy, and there are many groups actually trying to do that. For example, for this particular family, uh, ask me in a year, and maybe we can say more. Well, we'll pin your name on that conjecture for now. Okay, so more more questions. Polly has a question. So I have two questions. Uh, first question: oh, in, What is the name of uh, a function in GeoGebra that uh, helps with uh, uh, complex numbers. Yeah, it's complex numbers. Um, well, here's here's Ge GeoGebra. Um, so the oops. Uh, I just want to put something. Mm. Okay, let me. Uh huh. That will be easier. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to make it bigger. So you can do. Um, I'm sorry for non Ukrainian speakers. You can actually put a complex number. There's a there's a menu called put a point and you can introduce a complex number mm -hmm. just here. And when you place it in the menu where the algebra is displayed, uh, well, unfortunately there are a lot of complex numbers. It's this one is called Z16. And this is the, the coordinates of this complex number. 
I guess you can just type uh, something like two plus uh, uh, one, or I know, like five uh, times pi. You see, and it produces another complex number. So you can either uh, embed that or that. And if something is is kind of embedded as a complex number, then if you do manipulation with that, GeoGebra understands that this is a complex number. Okay. okay. And second question: uh, Can you recommend some books is about uh, uh, polynomials that uh, uh, can maybe explain more things? Um, this is a good question. Um, so unfortunately, there is no uh, book that um, that requires a little bit. Uh, so there's a beautiful um, book by 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 John Milner, um, uh, something like dynamics in uh, one complex complex variable. So Milner uh, is a, is a legendary mathematician known for his extremely good writing skills. Um, so this is a book that I recommend to read, but that might require a little bit of um, knowledge uh, in, uh, in in analysis. Um, unfortunately, I know only of a draft of a book uh, which is kind of suitable for undergraduates, but it's not public. But uh, yeah, probably Milner is the, the best uh, approximation. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question. Let me just throw in there that I'm very good friends with the founder of GeoGebra, and he's another filthy rich mathematician. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Costiante. Yep. It pays to have good ideas, is all I'm saying. <laughs> okay, more, more questions. Xenia or Costiante. Yeah. Uh, Constantine, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, um, one question is, uh, does the area of a filled Julia set converge to a certain number? Um, and if yes, then uh, is there some sort of formula to calculate it? Um, so let me try to... Um, so you're asking... If I if I open, for example, like this picture, what is the area of this this white region to the right? Yeah. Um, so when you when you say the area, uh, it depends on kind of your level of education. Uh, as we define it at school, it has no area, uh, but it can can have like a measure. So you can you can study this sort of a measure of the of the Julia set. Uh, so measure is a substitute for an area if you don't if you cannot compute an area, um, and um, the the answer is actually it's hard to compute. Sometimes uh, you can say that this is a very small set. For example, this particular picture on the right, I can assure you that the uh, well the area uh, is zero. Right, the area is zero doesn't mean that the set is empty, but the area is zero. So the Lebesgue measure of this set is zero. In many instances, uh, using kind of the result that we proved with Dirk, we can show that the, the area is zero. But it is actually not clear, even for polynomials. So if I if I go to certain polynomials in the Mandelbrot set, it's not clear uh, what is the area of uh, of the Julia sets, right? For example, for this one, it is known because the dynamics uh, of a critical point is simple, but there are polynomials where it is not, um, uh, where it is not known, uh, or it was just recently established. Well, for example, let me um, advertise uh, a little bit. So there's a lot of combinatorics in the motherboard set, but I can go to a parameter which is called a Fibonacci parameter, so more or less, I have to kind of zoom in here, and then I have to zoom in here. So roughly speaking, I look at the picture now. I I see kind of three big bulbs, um, and I zoom between uh, the 
second largest and the third largest. And I again see three big bulbs. I zoom somewhere here. And I zoom somewhere here. And as you can now observe, actually nothing, not much is changing. And uh, so somewhere, somewhere here, there's a there's a particular parameter, uh, which is called a golden Ziegel parameter. Uh, a golden because it is related to the golden Fibonacci number. And uh, uh, the th recent theorem, like uh, from a couple of years ago, tells that there is a parameter over here, such that if I look at this set. There is a there is a kind of this big bulbs and there is an interface like there's a Julia set and there is a theorem that tells that the Julia set of um, kind of this interface is not zero so it's actually a very very large bulb set but it's insanely hard and it's impossible just to write a formula and another example which probably will connect to uh, to the lecture uh, that you attended. Uh, in the beginning, um, where you, let me quickly zoom out. Um, so there was a lecture uh, about uh, logistic family, and uh, the place where I should find, and I, I think the uh, Feigenbaum was, was mentioned there. So more or less, if I go along the real line with these bulbs, I go in here, then I go in here, then you see the precision starts to, to break down. I have to adjust the precision. It takes more time to recompute um, the whole set. Um, well, it really takes time to recompute. And uh, I can zoom again. And at this point, you will not see the difference from the previous picture. And this is kind of a, a deep result of some similarity of the Julia set. And somewhere here at the tip, there is a famous Feigenbaum parameter of uh, of certain polynomial for which the critical point does, does a weird stuff. So it's not periodic, it accumulates to what is called a counter set. And it was proved only recently in 2020 that this Julia set has uh, measure zero or the area zero. And uh, it was proved using a computer. So there's a computer assisted proof by Artyom Dutko, well, one of the archive uh, of born mathematicians and uh, Scott Sutherland. And, uh, and again, it's just a couple of years ago. So it is a hard question, which probably tells that there is no closed formula for the area, but this is a good question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Xenia. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask, uh, you've mentioned that uh, the points on the edge of the Julia set, when you iterate them, they stay on the edge of the Julia set. Do they stay at the same point? Are they like all fixed points or do they move around the edge of the Julia set? Um, that That's a good question. Um, they do both depending on the point. So let me uh, just uh, quickly go back. Uh, let us pick a particular, well, our favorite Basilica Julia set. That depends on the point. So for example, um, if I zoom here, so this is a fixed point. So this point will stay fixed if I iterate. So this is kind of in the Julia set, like at this boundary. Any of these uh, kind of pinching points, it will uh, do the following. It will, for example, this one, uh, try to watch this cross. It will jump here, right? You observe that. If I take, for example, this point, it will jump here and then it will stay fixed. So all the pinching, they will stay fixed. Um, there are points that will do kind of a, a Dublin map of a circle. It's, uh, Vadim Kaloshin probably told you a couple of days ago. So there will be like a periodic points, but there will be points with the orbit that will more or less fill the whole set, right? So they will be really chaotic orbits. So in short, it depends on the point. Um, so it can be 
it can be periodic, it can be fixed, which is a kind of a particular case of being periodic, or it can be uh, uh, dense in the Julia set, what is called, which means that if you take a point and if you have a computer with infinite precision, then you start iterating and more or less it will kind of trace the whole set. So, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a uh, David has another question. Yes, I just um, thought about because you mentioned this um, circle doubling that uh, Vadim talked about. Um, can you somehow reduce the problem of like the boundary of the Julia set to that circle? Maybe like oh. is there um, like some function that maps the boundary to the to the circle where you then can explore the dynamics on the circle and then map it back? Or yes. That's that's a oh, really? uh, that, okay. that's a that's a great question, and uh, this is actually one of the um, well discoveries of Duadin Hubbard. So let us again take this basilica, and since it is a scientific program, um, so in the complement of this uh, black set, the dynamics mm -hmm. is more or less uh, as the doubling. So um, uh, let me. Let me show you. Um, so there's a, um, there are what is called rays, external rays. So I drew two uh, white lines. And uh, what would happen if I take this line? So if I take this line, the point here, just, just observe, right? It will go more or less, okay, let me take it a bit more careful, point here. Then it goes to here, then it goes to here, then it goes to here, then it goes to here. So this point escapes to infinity actually along these two lines. And uh, the way these lines are drawn, you see what I was doing, I was uh, kind of putting some sort of angle uh, and the angle I put is one third. And one third is exactly at two periodic point under, under, under the Dublin map. Remember, how do you do the Dublin map? You take one third, you multiply it by two, two thirds, you multiply mm -hmm. it by two, it's four thirds, but you have to do mod one. So it returns back to mm -hmm. one third, which actually tells that kind of in this green region, you can conjugate the dynamics actually to the, um, well, let me simplify a little bit to uh, mm -hmm. Z square, uh, Z goes to Z square. And the whole complication of the Julia set is coming from the fact, so the most simple situation is, is this one. So this is the Julia set for, for the map Z goes to Z square. And here you will have just straight lines, right? Uh, the, uh, the external rays will be one third. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, external rays here will be one third and uh, another one will be about well, two thirds. Right, there will be just straight lines. And what you can kind of morally think, take the, uh, the Dublin map of a circle, connect all the orbits of periodic points by these lines, and then collapse them together, right? The one that kind of these two points collapse together. And this is actually what you get when you go here, right? These two rays lens together. When you go here, you need to kind of collapse more rays. And the, the theorem tells you that if you know how to collapse this race, uh, then you can actually study all these fractal sets. Uh, but this is not, um, okay. yeah, this is not kind of straightforward. And this is, but this is a very good question. So collapsing of this race, or in short, kind of understanding how to go from the, the, the Dublin map in the quadratic case to mm -hmm. the polynomials through this Julia sets is a, uh, uh, there is a way, but it requires a little bit of knowledge of the set. Okay, thank you. It's so I think it's a, a, um, a good point to call it a special lecture. <laughs> uh, Kostiantin, maybe you can stay behind a little bit and our Ukrainian students can stay behind a little bit um, and you can chat a little bit in Ukrainian. Um, and to the rest of you, I wish uh, a very nice evening or a very good day. <laughs> some, yeah. some of you are ahead on, uh, ahead on time. 
Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in tomorrow's lecture by Svetlana Neberoda. Uh, so Svetlana is an applied mathematician. Oh, hmm. she's really both. Uh, she's a pure and applied mathematician. Uh, and her research is having a tremendous impact on the development of modern technologies. And tomorrow we'll uh, learn more about it from her. Uh, so goodbye. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.